Chapter 6 The Meaning of Love Encounter with Viktor Frankl, Alexander Vesely, and Mary Simaluka. Opening quote from Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is said into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. Love and the Endurance of Suffering Viktor Frankl wrote those words shortly after he was liberated from a Nazi concentration camp. He was describing an experience of the power of love that occurred one day in the camp. That day was like countless other days in the camp. He was forced to march for miles through the snow in the pitch black. His feet were swollen with edema in shoes that were falling apart. Every single step became real torture, he wrote. Hurry up, you pigs! This was the constant insult from the Nazi guards. If anyone slipped on the ice, the guard would hit him with the butt of a rifle. Though Frankel's existence in that moment seemed pointless, his mind clung to the image of his 24-year-old wife, Tilly. He saw her with uncanny acuteness. As the sun rose, their work began, pickaxing frozen ground for endless hours. Yet he was able to keep his inner eye fixed on the image of Tilly, his beloved. Was she even alive? He had no idea. They had last seen each other in the selection line at Auschwitz, separated by an unalterable fate. His parting words to her, Tilly, stay alive at any price. Do you hear me? At any price. Frankel, for her birthday one year, had given her a small globe pendant, and it was inscribed with the words, The world turns on love. Though they were stripped of that pendant, and their wedding rings at Auschwitz, somehow this truth remained. The world turns on love. As he concentrated on Tilly's image, she became a real presence to him. He said, more and more I felt that she was present, that she was with me. I had the feeling that I was able to touch her able to stretch out my hand and grasp hers. The feeling was very strong. Franco realized that, in a sense, it didn't matter whether Tilly was alive or not. For love, he said, goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved. In other words, Frankel's love for Tilly did not depend solely upon her. It found its deepest meaning in his spiritual being, his inner self, he said. Love is internal to the lover. It requires nothing back from the beloved. Love is what enabled his survival in the concentration camps. Love for his wife, love for his mother, and love for his spiritual child, which is what he called the book that he wanted to finish. This love empowered his will to meaning. Shortly after his liberation from the Nazi camps, Frankel returned to Vienna. He learned that his wife, Tilly, and his mother had both been killed in the camps. 
he wrote to his close friends, The best have not returned, and now I'm all alone. Mysteriously, the confirmation of love came Victor's way. He was walking along the road, and he saw a man with a tiny golden globe pendant in his palm. It was just like the one he had given Tilly on her birthday many years ago. He looked at it and saw that it said, The world turns on love. Frankel knew there were only two of these pendants. He bought it from the man, and he said, It was dented slightly, but the whole world did still turn on love. Viktor Frankl experienced characteristic humility. He said, I think the only appropriate attitude to such coincidences is to not even try to explain them. Anyway, I'm too ignorant to explain them and too smart to deny them. Franco was 92 when he said those words. It was 50 years after his liberation from the Nazi camps. So who was Viktor Frankl? Viktor Frankl is widely known as the founder of a school of psychotherapy called Logotherapy, or Existential Analysis. His approach of healing through meaning is regarded as the third Viennese school of psychotherapy. The other two are founded by Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler. At age three, Viktor Frankl knew he wanted to be a physician, and it was actually Sigmund Freud who influenced him to go into psychiatry. When Frankl was only 16, Freud accepted an article written by him for publication in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. Age 16. Then Frankel received both his MD and his PhD degrees from the University of Vienna. Suicide prevention was what became the major thrust of his life's work. To insist on the meaningfulness of human life no matter how wretched the circumstances. He founded Vienna's first private youth counseling program to help prevent suicide. From 1930 to 1937, he was in charge of an entire ward at the university clinic that handled 12,000 women who had attempted suicide. He treated them as fellow human beings, not as problem cases or broken people. To him, they were real people, and they had a meaning to their existence. Frankl saw his work primarily as encounter. That was his word, not a technique. Encounter. To illustrate, he liked to tell the story of a woman who called him at his home at 3 a.m. She was determined to commit suicide. He gave every argument and used every technique he could think of to dissuade her from ending her life. After 30 minutes, she had not budged from her plan. Finally, he convinced her to come the next morning to his hospital so they could talk in person. When she arrived, she told him that the only reason she had decided not to take her life was the fact that he had listened to her patiently in the middle of the night. He wasn't angry with her for disturbing his sleep. That encounter made her believe that a world in which this can happen must be a world worth living in. Franco was interested in the spiritual dimension of his patients. He found that they were not fundamentally driven by a will to pleasure, as Freud said, or a will to power and money, as Adler said, but rather a will to meaning. Frankel's promising medical career took a fateful turn when the Nazis seized Austria. In 1939, they made him the head of neurology at Rothschild, 
which was the only Jewish hospital in Vienna, as Jewish patients. The position provided temporary protection from deportation for Victor and his parents, but they witnessed the mass deportation of their friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Jews and other targeted groups were forced out of their homes and businesses. Buildings were, quote, Aaronized. Beatings, rapes, theft, and insults were a daily occurrence. Jews were not allowed on public transportation. Suicide was rampant. With the help of another doctor, Frankel avoided assigning their patients a diagnosis that the Nazis would use as grounds for killing. The other doctor was a member of the Nazi party. Yet, he aided in the obstruction of Nazi goals. And thus it was that Viktor Frankl saw how impossible it would be to carry out collective guilt, meaning blaming all Germans for the horrible crimes of the Nazi system, because Frankl had known people in the Nazi party Perhaps they had joined to protect their own families, and they had risked their lives to save the lives of those the Nazis wanted to exterminate. Thus, Franco refused to judge others, and in this famous quote, he tells us, No man should judge unless he himself, in absolute honesty, whether in a similar situation he might have done the same. The day of decision arrived. In 1942, after years of delay, the American consulate in Vienna sent notice to Viktor Frankl that he could pick up his visa and immigrate to the United States. Sigmund Freud and Adler, they had already left Austria for a safer land. But Viktor Frankl was torn. Should he leave Austria? He could escape deportation. He could escape the concentration camps. He could give his life's work a chance to flourish in the United States. Or should he stay to protect his elderly parents and face certain death? He couldn't decide. He took a walk through the city, and when he returned home, he was still undecided. And there on the table, he saw a little piece of marble that his father had picked up. His father had found it in the rubble of a destroyed synagogue. His father said it was a Hebrew letter from one of the Ten Commandments. Victor asked him, well, which one, which commandment? And his father said, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Well, Frankel made his decision. He stayed upon the land with his parents, and he allowed the visa to lapse. Shortly after that decision, he met and married his wife, Tilly. They were one of the last Jewish couples given a wedding permit under the Nazi regime. But the Nazis forced them to abort their unborn child. Frankel, his parents, and Tilly were soon deported. Frankel spent three years in four different camps. Auschwitz, he said, is where I struck out my former life. He was separated from Tilly there, and he never saw her again. Upon arrival in a cattle car, prisoners were selected. That was the term. Selected either for labor or to be gassed to death. 90% of Frankel's transport was sent immediately to the gas chamber to be murdered in Moss. 
A person was allowed a bare existence only if they were useful to the Nazi regime. Tilly, for example, survived initially as slave labor in a munitions plant. Others were used for cruel medical experiments, including children. Once the prisoners were no longer useful, they were gassed or they were left to starve to death. Frankel describes how they watched their bodies devour themselves to the point of becoming skeletons. At Auschwitz, Frankel writes, everyone was stripped of their clothes. They were shaven like sheep for the slaughter. He said not a hair was left on our entire bodies. He heard the sound of leather straps hitting naked bodies, followed by screams. He said, we had nothing now except our bare bodies. All we possessed, literally, was our naked existence. Tilly, before they had been deported, sewn the manuscript for his book on logotherapy inside his coat. But this, too, was taken from him. He called it his spiritual child. It was his life's work. But now it was gone. As Victor pondered whether he had anything to live for, he was given an old, torn coat. He reached into the pocket, and he found a scrap of paper that had the beloved Jewish prayer, Shema Yisrael, written. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Touching this piece of paper and seeing the prayer, Franco writes, how else could I interpret this, quote, coincidence than as a challenge to me to live what I had written, to practice what I had preached? From that point on, that page stayed with me, hidden in the lining of my coat. Frankel knew he had to be the book that he had written on logotherapy. It was entitled, The Doctor and the Soul. He said Auschwitz and the concentration camps were the experimentum crucis, that is, necessary experiment for the testing of logotherapy, which is healing through meaning. His theory was that meaning comes in three ways. Each one is a path of self-transcendence. The first is a creative work, or a deed, or a vocation, or calling. The second path of meaning is an experience, or an encounter, with another person, with beauty, truth, or nature. It's a path of love. For example, with a person, loving them in their total uniqueness. The third path of meaning he called attitudinal. This is about the attitude that a person takes when they're faced with inescapable suffering. Can they bear it with inner fortitude? Can they have an inner triumph in the face of unavoidable suffering? This, he said is the third path of meaning. He says that self-actualization will elude us if we try to seek it as our goal. But when we give ourselves to a cause greater than ourselves, or if we love someone other than ourselves, then happiness and joy will be the inevitable byproducts. In the camps, self-giving aided survival, and Frankel himself was an example. When he was sick with typhus and fellow prisoners were dying all around him, 
He forced himself to transcend the fatal situation out of resolve to reconstruct his manuscript. For 16 solid days, he kept himself awake, even in the night, to prevent vascular collapse and delirium. He used a pencil stub and some stolen Nazi forms that were given to him by a friend to scribble notes for his book. In this way, he wasn't succumbing to the fever, and he didn't die of the typhoid. In the death camps, Frankel saw firsthand the heroism of this kind of self-transcendence, and he saw it in both the prisoners and the guards. Prisoners gave up their last piece of bread to share with another. And some of the Nazi guards risked their lives to do small acts of mercy for the prisoners. Frankel's theories of life's inherent meaning were put to the ultimate test when he returned to Vienna after Hitler's defeat. This is when he learned that his mother had been murdered, gassed at Auschwitz, and Tilly had died at a women's camp in Bergen-Belsen. And this was the same camp where Anne Frank died. Victor had clung to the hope of reunion with Tilly and his mother. Now he wondered, what's the point? Is there anything to live for? There was no one and nothing for Viktor Frankl. He had little will to exist, but he did decide that he would not commit suicide until after he had written his book. He said, Once I knew that my family was gone except for a sister in Australia, this was the only thing I wanted to do before dying. And beyond that, I didn't want to exist. But I decided not to commit suicide, at least not before I had reconstructed my first book, The Doctor and the Soul. And thus, Frankel wrote out his unique theories called Logotherapy, and they were published in German in 1946. In 1955, the book was published in English under the title The Doctor and the Soul. Now, Frankel protested the word soul because of its religious connotation. We might say perhaps innermost being would be inclusive of both religious and non-religious persons. Frankel was a practicing Jew. His faith was very important to him. He did his daily prayers with the phylacteries in private. Yet he didn't assume religion was the only way to actualize one's ultimate meaning. Friends who read that book on logotherapy asked Frankel to write another book about his experience in the concentration camps. He wrote, Man's search for meaning in only nine days, weeping nonstop in an empty room with windows that had been bombed out by the war. He dictated around the clock to three different typists. That book, Man's Search for Meaning, is an all time bestseller. In the United States, it's listed as one of the 10 most influential books in America, according to a survey conducted with the Library of Congress. It's a standard text in American colleges. It's treasured around the world. Mother Teresa, the Catholic saint, encouraged her novices to read Man's Search for Meaning as part of their spiritual formation in her order. Love Brings Meaning. Victor's books were written. Well, now what? Well, the unexpected. 
romantic love filled the void of his life. He was still dispirited from all of his losses, but his will to meaning was restored through the personal love of a young Catholic dental assistant who worked at the clinic where he worked. Her name was Ellie. She was a strong and heartfelt woman who spoke her mind. Victor and Ellie moved in together. And then as soon as they received the official paperwork that confirmed Tilly's death, they were married. Victor and Ellie had a daughter and eventually two grandchildren. One of them, Alexander, was interviewed for this chapter. Ellie became a life partner to Victor in every way. Their marital love was unusual because it had equality and transparency. It was a fulfillment of the high ideal of human love that Franco wrote about in The Doctor and the Soul. He wrote, Love is much deeper than sexual attraction and erotic bonding. Now, Frankel was not a moralist regarding sex. He saw its ultimate purpose was an expression of love. He wrote, Sex is justified, even sanctified, as soon as, but only as long as, it's a vehicle of love. End of quote. Love, he said, is one of the three paths of meaning in life. It doesn't have to be romantic or marital love, though often it is. In the state of love, whatever the love is, the lover sees the innermost spiritual core of the beloved. Franco writes, Love is living the experience of another person in all of his uniqueness and singularity. In love, the beloved person is comprehended in his very essence as unique and singular. He is comprehended as a thou, capital T. As a human person, he becomes for the one who loves him indispensable and irreplaceable without having done anything to bring it about. Love is not deserved, is unmerited, is simply grace. End of quote. He said love is a spiritual act. It apprehends a person not only as he is in his uniqueness and singularity, but also what he can and will be. In other words, the lover sees and nurtures the value potentialities of the beloved. Loving someone brings out the best in them. Love helps the beloved person to become as the lover sees him. Love, Frankel said, is the only way to grasp another human being in the innermost core of his personality. This is the kind of love that Frankel had with Ellie. He freely acknowledged her crucial presence for him and also for his work of logotherapy. She is the counterpart to me, he said, both qualitatively and quantitatively. What I accomplish with my brain, she fulfills with her heart. The well-known philosopher Jacob Needleman once said, referring to the way in which Ellie has been my companion on our lecture tours, Ellie is the warmth that accompanies the light. In this environment of familial love, Victor Frankl's professional life flourished. There were professorships, honorary degrees, 39 books, hundreds of lectures, and many awards. His zest for life never faded. He was an avid mountain climber his entire life. 
and at 67, earned his first pilot's license. Personal Encounter In 1980, I was 15. I visited Dachau and Auschwitz. It was with a global education group. Frankel describes being in camps that belonged to the Auschwitz and Dachau complexes. Touring those camps at 15 was my first introduction to the Holocaust. I remember the shock that hit me when I learned that the Nazis killed an estimated 15 to 16 million people between 1933 and 1945. Their goal was to, quote, purify their state. Hitler's Nazism sought to exterminate Jews, the Roma, that's gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, people with disabilities, political resistors, and homosexuals. What I saw seared into me. The displays showed photographs of hundreds of starved corpses thrown on top of each other as if in a garbage heap. There were rooms full of human hair, artificial limbs, clothes, and shoes. These had been stripped from the prisoners' bodies when they entered the camp or after they had been gassed. Some of the clothing and artifacts had belonged to babies and children. I saw the little shoes. Not before or since have I ever set foot in such a desolate and eerie place. The cold, mechanistic attitude toward human life was incomprehensible. Viktor Frankl viewed Nazism and the Holocaust as the consequence of a nihilistic, philosophical, and scientific reductionism that reduced the human being to nothing but a mechanical process determined by biological drives. His warning strikes a chord in our own time when mass consumerism, scientific, technological advances carry this very risk of dehumanization. Here's what Frankel tells us. If we present man with a concept of man that's not true, we may well corrupt him. When we present man as an automaton of reflexes, a mind machine, a bundle of instincts, a pawn of drives and reactions, a mere product of instinct, heredity, and environment, then we feed him the nihilism to which modern man is prone. Victor says, I became acquainted with the last stage of that kind of corruption in my second concentration camp Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment. The Nazis liked to say, of blood and soil. I'm absolutely convinced that the gas chambers were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. End of quote. As I stood at age 15 on the eerie grounds of Auschwitz and Dachau. I could not have agreed more with Viktor Frankl. Evil is not the opposite of love, but its absence. 
if humans are reducible to mechanics, to, quote, usefulness or good genetics, then there's an absence of love. And where is the capacity to endure for a noble purpose? We call unfortunates. Those people that society says they can be gotten rid of for the, quote, good of society. And others can even decide to kill them out of mercy, they say. For they ask, well, who would want to live like that? And so we see a soullessness is projected onto what people call unfortunates. Frankel, addressing this, tells the story of a mother who tried to kill herself and her young son who had genetic disabilities. She saw him as an unfortunate. But the boy stopped her. He said he didn't want to die. He liked his life, even with severe disabilities. And this is what love knows. Love knows the value of life per se. And this was the great teaching of Mother Teresa, who rescued the rejected, the unwanted babies, the abandoned elderly, the diseased poor. She treated them as divine. In my own experience, I saw in my mother that meaning is present even in cases of dementia and severe disability. In the last eight years of my mother's life, she lost all physical functioning and mental cognition. She no longer recognized me, and what she said made no logical sense. People observing said, Oh, how tragic. Your mother's just a vegetable. She might as well die. But I was influenced by Mother Teresa and Viktor Frankl. I saw beneath the outer condition of her disease, her deformity, and somehow I saw an inner essence, and it became more and more vivid. Maybe this is what Frankl referred to as the soul. As a professor, I've assigned man's search for meaning to my college students for over 20 years. They read it alongside the Dalai Lama's book, My Land, My People. Both books are firsthand accounts of genocide in the mid-20th century. One book is written by a Jewish doctor, Viktor Frankl. The other book is written by a Tibetan Buddhist monk, the Dalai Lama. Even though they're from widely different backgrounds, both of these men affirm the power of love to sanctify our lives with meaning. No matter how wretched the circumstances, they say that our life calls us to refuse the seduction of blame, despair, and collective guilt. Yes, of course, there are biological, psychological, and sociological conditions that bear upon us daily. But these outer conditions never can take away our inner freedom to decide how we will face the circumstances of our life. Viktor Frankl insisted that by endeavoring to extract the meaning out of our unescapable fate, at that point, we turn our predicament into an inner triumph. As he writes, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, end of quote. Over the years, as I've assigned Man's Search for Meaning to my students, I've seen that book actually save their lives I've had students haunted by the temptation to kill themselves. And honestly, the numbers are surprisingly high of those who hang at the edge of that decision. 
Many students are in patterns of what we call passive suicide. That is, they put themselves in harm's way with reckless sex, drunk driving, drug abuse, degrading and abusive relationships, self-harming, and various, quote, accidents. Frankel's book is a bold treatise on meaningfulness, and it helps these students decide to see that their lives are worth caring for. For example, one young woman came to my office. She was in a long-standing relationship with a man who abused her. She knew it was a bad situation, but she felt trapped. She told me, well, where else can I go? At least I have a roof over my head. Her life had barely begun, and she had already succumbed to what Victor Franco called give up itis. And here we see passive suicide. By the end of the term, however, she had left that abusive situation. After reading Frankel's book, she felt she had a responsibility for her life. She likened her life to a precious jewel. And she told me, I had to pull the jewel out of the dump and make it shine. Who else was going to do it but me? And she quoted a sentence from Frankel's that had become her life motto. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Victor Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning because he thought it might be helpful to those who were prone to despair. He affirmed Nietzsche's words, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. The primary existential questions are, one, does my life have meaning? Two, what? does life ask of me? Conversation with Alexander Vesely and Mary Simaluka. In 2015, I invited Victor Frankl's grandson, Alexander Vesely, and Mary Simaluka, who's the Frankl family representative. They came to our university to share their experience with students who had studied Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Alexander and Mary are co-founders of Noetic Films. Their first project was the film, Victor and I directed by Alex, and produced by Mary. They visited courses in English literature, psychology, and religious studies. They talked with students, faculty, staff, and community members. They screened their film, Victor and I, before a large audience. Everybody appreciated meeting them and seeing the film. During their visit, I interviewed them about Frankel, and they give an intimate portrayal of Victor, his life, his love, and his work, and his impact on their lives. In what follows, Alexander Vesely reads this interview. Conversation with Alexander Vesely and Mary Simaluka. Recollections on Viktor Frankl. Friend. Alex, what stands out to you about your grandfather? Alex. He cared about finding and speaking the truth. This was his quest in every situation. And he didn't care about gaining societal approval. He cared about the people in his presence. He gave you that same loving presence and attention whether you were a family member or a patient coming into his office or hospital or a young woman working the microphone. Mary, that's how I first met Viktor Frankl. It was 1987. At the time, I owned a recording company and the American Psychiatric Association was a client. Dr. Frankl was the keynote speaker at their annual meeting that year
because he was receiving the Oscar Pfister Award. I had to put the microphone on him for the event, and I was nervous. He was larger than life, even though he was physically a small man. I went up to the stage as he was talking to a bunch of smart people, and I said quietly, Excuse me, Dr. Frankel. He stopped what he was doing and turned to look at me. Young lady, what can I do for you? He made me feel comfortable when I was supposed to make him feel comfortable. He had a great ability to speak to the common man or woman, as well as to Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela. It didn't matter who was in front of him. He met us all on the same level. He had the ability to talk to you and look at you as if you were the only person in the room, the only thing that mattered to him. This was in a huge auditorium with 10,000 people. I could feel that he was genuinely interested in who I was and the work I was doing. Fran. Frankel gave his full love and attention to whomever he was with. Was that your experience, Alex, as a grandchild? Alex. He was a big child on some level. As a child, I felt connection with him because he was so playful. He was very serious about his work and highly intelligent. Yet he had a childlike joy and fun in him. People ask me, what was he like to be around? They are usually surprised to hear he was goofy, especially with the kids. For example, he liked to impersonate people and draw caricatures. He also loved to tell jokes and stories. He could tell the same joke a hundred times, but you still laughed every time because of his joy in it. He knew hundreds of jokes and each one would fit the situation. Now, however, if I tell those same jokes, they are not funny and no one laughs. Some of the jokes were actually not that funny, but when he told them, we all laughed. He would make you feel good. He had a therapeutic quality in his very nature. He was genuinely interested in you to be the best version of yourself and to make you feel good about who you are. Friend, how did he affirm the best version of you, Alex? Alex, perhaps the biggest impact he had on me was not by the things he said, but by the things he didn't say. When you're close or related to someone of that stature, people ask you, what did he pass on to you? Did he give you the secret formula to live a great life? And the answer is no. In fact, one of the strongest influences he had on me was that he never said, let me tell you how to do that. He never assumed the position of, I'll tell you how you should live your life. He respected you and how you chose to live. He lived his life in his way, and by virtue of his example, I could learn by witnessing. Fran, yes, I noticed in his writings and speeches, he never presumed to be an authority on someone else's life, even as a psychiatrist with his patients. And as his grandson, you felt free to become yourself? Alex, I remember one instance in particular. We were talking about religion. I felt an urge to tell him that I had decided to believe in certain things. He hadn't asked me about it, he never probed me about my beliefs. It simply came up in the discussion. His response was, I believe you. And it wasn't about the content of being religious or not. He didn't praise me or question me. It was simply an acknowledgement of me as a person who had thought through an important question for myself. I think he appreciated that I was making a decision there. Friend, your film Victor and I reveals that he himself was devoted to God as ultimate meaning. Alex, this is something he kept very much to himself. He prayed every morning behind closed doors. He was religious, but didn't see it as his job as a psychiatrist to initiate the topic of religion. It was up to the individual patient whether or not to include God in their personal search for meaning, or as he put it, to believe in the task giver behind each meaningful task. Friend, he didn't try to change or persuade you? Alex, I think that was his greatest gift. One felt completely accepted in his presence. Perhaps because he had accepted everything within himself, he knew and accepted that people had the best and worst in them. He was most interested in the best in people. Fran, and he encouraged people to think for themselves? Alex, he was something of a prophet. He saw things before they happened. He said, I don't see myself as such a great thinker. I just think things through to the end. And he did. For example, there is that nice saying, you're not dead as long as people remember you. He said, that's no consolation at all. Think it through, Alex. If I die tomorrow, you will remember me until you die, and then after that I'm dead. 
What difference will a few decades make? I don't need anybody to remember me. Life is valued whether or not it's remembered. I think that having his work, Logotherapy, remembered was more important to him than being remembered as a person. He wanted his work to be out there, to be accessible, and for people to be able to benefit from it long after he was gone. And I think he has reached that goal. Logotherapy is helping people all over the world. The interest is growing despite the fact that he has been gone for almost 20 years. There are conferences, congresses, institutes, training programs, and of course, all the books. Friend, through your film, we see the transformative power of a person who lived his message. What happened when he died? Alex, it was a huge loss. We were all close as a family. Growing up, I spent a lot of time with him. It was hard to lose him. My grandfather found a lot of grounding in family. And of course, his wife, my grandmother, is a strong personality who kept him grounded. They were equals, and he needed that. They were good for each other. They did the work of logotherapy together. Marriage and love for a beloved person. Friend, in fact, the excellent biography by Klingberg is a book of both of them, not just Victor. It would be impossible to separate the man from his marriage. One thing that may surprise people is how transparent Victor and Ellie were with each other. They freely spoke their feelings and ideas in the moment. Visitors were shocked that they openly disagreed with one another, sometimes in raised voices. Alex, that is true. If there was a disagreement, you knew it. They took no prisoners. Friend, when you think about your grandparents' marriage, what does it tell us about love? Alex, I will say that it wasn't easy for my grandmother. Perhaps it's always hard when you're the second wife and the first one died so young. You know, in man's search for meaning, it's all about Tilly. This was his first wife, whom he loved very much, and she died in the camps. One of Ellie's friends, Marianne Gruber, whom I interviewed in Victor and I, knew both of my grandparents well. She saw the dynamic between them up close. She told me Ellie, though she was very young when they married, grew up fast. Ellie was only 20, he was 40. She lived through the war and people grew up faster in that generation. Ellie was tough and that's what he needed. Someone who could stand up for herself and stand up to him, yet be unconditionally beside him. My grandmother made the very conscious decision to sacrifice a lot, not only to be Viktor Frankl's wife, but also to do the work of logotherapy. She took care of every book, over 30 of them, every letter, usually about 24 letters a day. In those days, it wasn't email. They answered every letter on the typewriter. She did all of the typing of correspondence, all the books, and she was at his side for 50 years. They did the work of logotherapy every day. That was their focus. They had visitors constantly. They made 92 trips to the U.S. for lectures. They went to every continent. She was with him, helping him behind the scenes. They were a team. She devoted her life to him and to logotherapy. Ellie is 90 now, and still she is working for logotherapy. Since she can read his handwriting, it's primarily up to her to sort the archives. Friend, I also like learning in the biography that Ellie had a room of her own, a space where she went for quiet and time with herself. Somehow, her love for him was totally self-giving, yet not self-depleting. She gave out of her own wholeness as an individual. Alex, and here is the point about the power of love. She did all this work with him and for him. You would think that this devotion could diminish a person, make her become less and less herself, and take her away from being who she can be. But their friends whom I interviewed said, it was the opposite. Ellie grew from it. She stepped into her own. It was her life's calling as much as his. Friend. Love, by definition, requires freedom and personal choice. It seems that Ellie chose logotherapy as a path of meaning and love. Alex, love was the foundation on that decision to be his partner in his work as well as life. This love was a path of meaning for her. She was the secretary, the person who answered the phone, and was also the caretaker. She was everything to him. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about Viktor Frankl if it weren't for Ellie Frankl. Friend. Love is one of Frankl's three paths of meaning, and Ellie lived it. She told their biographer, Don Klingberg, that it was their deep love that made it possible for her to bear the demands of their life together.
Without a very deep love, we never could have done it. It would have been impossible for me. Victor was not a bad man, but he was out of touch and did his work with little understanding of practical things. To change a light bulb was almost too much. Ellie's love actually saved his life, didn't it? Alex. He was suicidal just after the war. In 1945, he came back to Vienna and learned the horrible news that his mother was killed in the gas chambers until he had also died in the camps. He knew what Ellie had done for him. He was very grateful. Their love was meaningful to both of them. Fran, I wept at the scene in your film when Ellie received the honorary doctorate in Chicago in 1993. Your grandfather had received so many honorary degrees in the United States, but she only this one. They gave her a lengthy standing ovation. North Park University had wanted to confer the honor on both of them, but Dr. Frankel wrote to say he could not accept it for he wanted to make the honor only hers. While I appreciate it, I cannot accept it. As I see it, the more exclusively Ellie is to be honored, the more conspicuous it will be in making the occasion of special significance for her. Alex, if there hadn't been this deep love that was the foundation and that made them real equals, then it would not have worked. Fran, and they will not be together in the same burial ground because he's Jewish and she's Catholic. Alex, the city of Vienna offered him a special honored gravesite, but he declined. He wanted to be buried in the simple Jewish section of the cemetery. She'll be buried in her family cemetery on the other side of the city. It didn't bother them to be buried in different places. What mattered to them was the life they shared. They loved each other, and their love served something beyond themselves. That can never be taken away. Falling apart and friends for life. Friend. It often takes people of two different typologies to birth something. Yin and yang. Seems like you two have that kind of connection. Mary. That's why we work so well together. We are opposites. Fran. Mary. How did you get involved with Alex Films and now serve as the Frankel family representative? Mary. I read Man's Search for Meaning in college in the 1960s. And then I met Victor in 1987. But it was in 2008 that I really got Frankel. My life fell out from under me. I lost my entire family, one after the other. Every member of my family died. When I thought it couldn't get any worse, my best friend was brutally murdered, and I had to go to identify her body. I lost my mind, and I landed in a psych ward in D.C. Some neighbor found me on the kitchen floor and called 911. I woke up strapped to a bed in a straitjacket, looking around the white room. I had no memory of how I got there. I thought, I've died and this is either purgatory or the first stage of hell. Later, I realized I had become clinically depressed with what they call complicated grief. I would lose one person dear to me, and before I could grieve that loss, there would be another loss. This went on and on. I was mandated to stay for 21 days and be in the care of a psychiatrist. When I got there, he asked, how many people are still alive who are in the pictures at your house? I said, no one. I had lost everyone close to me. He came in the morning and said, I want you to read this book, Man's Search for Meaning. And I said, get out of here with that book. I know all about that book. It's not going to save me now. Everyone I love and care for is lying in the cemetery under a bed of roses. I need something more than Viktor Frankl. But he told me, your life parallels his, and someday you'll realize it. That was true. He came back a week later and said, The good news is you survived. The bad news is you survived. Here's how you can break out of here. Create a business plan for your new life. Write it up and give it to me. He let me out when I wrote up my business plan for a new life. At that point, I was safe from suicide. At 58, I wasn't fond of change. But six weeks later, I had sold my house, moved to a sunny place across the country, knowing no one, sight unseen to retire at the beach. My feeling of being settled lasted three months. I started to deteriorate, sitting at home crying. It's what Frankl calls an existential vacuum. I decided to go back to work in a business I owned that did recordings for conferences all over the world. I was recording the proceedings at a psychotherapy conference in 2008, and that's how I met Alex. Some people are friends for a season, and some for a lifetime. 
He's for a lifetime. We have a close bond. There are so many different kinds of love in this world. When you encounter another person at a heart-to-heart level and you just click, it's magical. When Alex told me he was Frankel's grandson, I was stunned. It's hard for me to get speechless, but in that moment, I was stunned to silence. He told me he was working on a video project for the Frankel archives. I said, this work needs to go to the world. He said, I don't think anyone will be interested in a movie about a dead psychiatrist from Vienna. But I knew the world would want to see it. So now it is a film, Victor and I. We are yin and yang, director and producer. I stay out of the creative part. To me, business is fun, like a jigsaw puzzle. We decided to form a company together, Noetic Films, to make films that change people's lives for the better. We're not interested in that next Hollywood dollar. We are interested in doing things that make an impact and can help people. As Dr. Frankel said, ever more people have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. That is one of my favorite quotes. The work of Frankel for me is personal. His work saved my life. He taught that regardless of our circumstances, we can find meaning in every moment. This is a meaningful moment here as we talk about it. The power of love is here. Alex, the film would not have happened without you, Mary. Hers is one of the stories where my grandfather would have said, this is exactly those things that I teach, lived out. To overcome these kinds of tragedies, of suffering, and move forward to do meaningful things. Fran, Mary, what did you discover from your breakdown experience? Mary, we all have to face suffering and we have to realize that ours may be different from another's. People would say to Frankel, I can't compare my suffering to yours. He would say, never compare suffering. Everyone has their own Auschwitz. He always put himself on the same level as those he encountered. Also, I found that if you live your life from the inside out, most of your days will be wonderful. You don't need stuff. You need to develop your heart and find others to give it to. What matters is to work, love, and speak from your heart. I'm here to serve, not take. To bend, not break. To love, not hate. Frankel gave us three ways to uncover meaning, and that's what I did. Creative way, write a book, make a movie, create a business, etc. Experiential way, encounter another person, love them in their uniqueness, or go somewhere that changes your life, like your students do in the meditation room. Attitudinal way, This is the path for those who face unavoidable suffering, such as an incurable illness or the death camps. It involves choosing your attitude. You can't escape the condition, but you can choose your attitude toward it and fill it with meaning. All three of these ways helped me to uncover the meaning in my life. Logotherapy, existential analysis. Pran, what is logotherapy? Alex, logos comes from the Greek word for meaning. Therapy is healing, healing through meaning. He created the term before he went to the concentration camps. We are meaning-oriented beings, and we long for meaning. If you struggle, you will become better if you find something meaningful that fills what he called the existential vacuum. Pran, another key aspect of logotherapy is to focus on the positive potential in a person, not on pathology. It's a kind of Pygmalion effect. How did Frankel exemplify this? Alex, he brought out the best in you, and he would communicate with the best version of you. People still did things that disappointed him, and he might discontinue his interactions with them, but he would rarely hold grudges. He would just let go of it. He would not waste time to take revenge. I think if you are filled with such a deep love within yourself and for life, there is no place for revenge. He wouldn't let anything negative get to him. I would have understood if he had been hateful, vengeful, and bitter. Having gone through what he went through, he lost everyone he loved. But he did not lose his faith in humankind. Although he struggled to have faith in humankind after the war, he ended up in logotherapy affirming a theory of humanity that seeks to elicit the potential for good and for meaning. Friend, what about the people who criticized him? Alex, he was not very fond of some people, but he gave those people the benefit of the doubt. He had humility. He would always assume the best in others, even those who assumed the worst about him. This is a basis in his theory of logotherapy, to look for the best in people. 
As you mentioned, he would say, if you take man as he is, you make him worse. If you take a man as he can be, you help him become who he can be, the best version of who he is. Of course he meant women too. He used the language of the time. He was not interested in the worst version of anyone and how we can analyze that. For example, in the film there is the story of how, after the war, my grandfather gave friendship to Gustav Baumhackel, a former Nazi doctor. He knew that Baumhackel had joined the Nazi party like many people at the time, but he also knew that Baumhackel was not a Nazi in his heart. Baumhackel struggled with the fact that he had joined the party and he regretted that decision. After the war, he was unemployed and my grandfather gave him a place to see patients at the clinic. Grandfather focused on the best version of you and acted as if you were already there. This had an uplifting effect on people. Still, he wasn't stupid or one-sided. I want to be clear that he didn't deny the horrors of humanity. How could he? He had come out of the worst savagery. He would say, after all, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he's also that being who entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Israel on his lips. How he went from this experience and then to say, here I am a psychiatrist and I will meet everybody who comes through my door as a potentially good person. This could not have been easy. I think it was a choice that he struggled with. He had to wrestle and come to a conclusion, and he did. It's a decision. There is a Hitler and there is a Mother Teresa in all of us, he would say. And it's a personal decision to decide which version of the two we're going to let ourselves become. Fran, what was the impact of the Holocaust on you, Alex? You must have heard a lot of the stories. Alex, I only learned about the Holocaust like you did, second-hand information. Maybe I know a little more because my grandfather was a survivor of the camps. He would tell you stories only if you wanted to hear them. Later in his life, he was not fond to talk about the Holocaust. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning to get it off his chest, but he didn't see it as defining him. When he met my grandmother, he told her all the stories and then said, no, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. You can't forget the past, but you have to move on. Otherwise, you waste the opportunities that life presents you in the here and now. His work was contrary to psychoanalysis at the time, which focused on the problems, going back into one's past and reliving it over and over again. He saw that method as not necessarily helpful because you can re-traumatize someone and make it worse. People then feel desperate, like they will never be in control of their present life, as if they are determined by what happened to them in the past. He represented the opposite model. You're not determined by what happened to you. You can determine your own fate by the way you deal with what happened to you. Death, suffering, and guilt. He called this the tragic triad that we cannot avoid. All of us will encounter these three things in one form or another. He tried to help people restructure their lives like Mary did when she made a business plan for a new life. A reorientation. You don't forget about what happened to you. But what are you going to do now? What are you still here for? What can you still give to the world? Fran, what was Frankel's take on Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Alex, Abraham Maslow in his hierarchy of needs said that once basic needs, food, shelter, are met, then the intangibles such as love, meaning, and self-actualization can be fulfilled. But my grandfather disagreed. He told Maslow how people did not have their basic needs met in the concentration camps, but it was the higher needs, i.e. meanings of love and values, that proved to be more relevant to their chance of survival. Maslow revised his ideas and said, Frankel is right. My grandfather emphasized that it's not about having what you need to live, but asking yourself, what am I living for? The most affluent societies have all their basic needs met, but they lack something to live for, and neurotic disorders tend to increase. Fran, Mary, how did logotherapy help you to get through all of your loss? Mary, with each successive loss, I had a pain in my heart that wouldn't go away, and disorientation, especially when my father died. He was my bedrock. When I lost him, I went into a black hole and didn't leave the house for a long time. When I woke up in the hospital, it felt like I was in a vat of mud. I couldn't stop wailing. Then, when wailing became more pain than pleasure, I confronted my situation. What am I going to do to change this? At that point, 
I was ready to look at the meaning of my life. For me, it was to create a business and to experience a place like Southern California. I've always wanted to live in sunshine by the ocean. Fran, is there a method you use now to avoid sinking back into depression? Mary, absolutely. I have rules for myself. I will not let myself go back down that black hole. I created a list of 10 principles. Here are a few of them. I don't allow people to interrupt my sleep. Sleep is critical for me. I have a visualization method to remove what I call ants, automatic negative thoughts. For everything out of my control, I write it down on paper and put it in what I call a something for God to do box. I've learned to let go of things I can't control and be responsible for the things I can control, like my inner thoughts. I am pretty disciplined with this. Also, I don't allow angry or negative people in my life. It's not unkindness, but survival. Individual Conscience and Decency Friend, as I was reading Frankel on conscience, I appreciated that he said conscience is intuitive and creative and has the power to discover meanings that contradict accepted values. As universal values are waning, he said, we have the responsibility to forge unique meanings. He gave the example of how he told Tilly, as they were forced to part at Auschwitz, to disobey one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, if she could foster her survival by doing so. He didn't want to be co-responsible for her death by insisting on a moral legalism. In that sense, love trumps legalism. His writings contain many examples of how conscience works differently than commandments or moralism or popular belief. His conscience made him say such things as decent people are in a minority and always will be. This was from a commemoration speech on the anniversary of Hitler's invasion of Vienna. That was not popular, was it? He was saying that there are two types of people in the world, the decent and the indecent, and they are found in all nations, races, and groups, even in the Nazi party of his time. This is very different from the victim-perpetrator dichotomy. Alex, that statement of his gets a lot of reaction. When a reporter asked him about it, he said that he didn't mean it in a pessimistic or optimistic manner, but in an activistic manner. He meant, let's make sure we are not so comfortable as to be certain we are among the decent. Let's keep our eye on the ball so that we strengthen the decent minority. Friend, people also criticize Frankel for saying there is meaning to be found in the concentration camp. Is that what he said? Alex, no, that's a misunderstanding. He wrote very concisely. He wanted to make his books as simple as possible so that anybody could read them. But then people take an already boiled down statement and remove a key phrase and say something like, your grandfather said Auschwitz had a meaning too. This is, of course, an absolute distortion. He said, if you are confronted with unavoidable suffering, what can you learn from the situation? How do we respond to apparently meaningless suffering? What will we do with that now, for we cannot change it? What meaning can we squeeze out of this seemingly meaningless situation? He did not say the situation itself was meaningful, but maybe a meaning can be derived by understanding what led to the Holocaust, so we have a chance to prevent it from ever happening again. In that commemoration speech, he gave a clear warning. No nation is immune to a Holocaust. No nation, Frankel warned us, is immune to a Holocaust. The end justifies the means, he said, is the operative principle of indecent leaders who would take us down a road of destruction. History's sobering lesson is that the majority of citizens silently follow these indecent leaders, even to the point of mass delusion and genocide. The end, he said, never justifies the means. I knew I was not exempt from such silent compliance. As I was listening to Alex and Mary describe Frankel's commitment to love others unconditionally and to honor their inner freedom to choose their own meaning, I knew how difficult this was in real life. I thought back to my years in the church and my compliance with leaders who excluded others from religious fellowship. They told me, well, the end justifies the means. 
To them, the end was purity, and the means was exclusion, shaming, shunning. These are all modes of force, not power. In that same commemoration speech on the anniversary of Hitler's invasion, Viktor Frankl referred to the Milgram experiment as evidence for the latent tendency toward compulsive obedience to the point of violence. This was a study done by Stanley Milgram at Yale University during the 1960s. It was a majority of the citizen sample who chose to obey an authority figure when told to administer the maximum level electric shock to another person for giving incorrect answers. In some cases in this experiment, the other person, who, by the way, was a researcher, was clearly showing signs of being tortured by the shocks. They were yelling, banging on a wall, begging, please stop, or falling silent as if perhaps near death. But the ordinary citizens who were in this experiment They ignored these distress signals. They chose to apply the maximum voltage against their suffering fellow when they were ordered to do so by an authority. So this experiment suggests that individuals with no background in abusive behavior will be cruel to innocence if they're in an institutional setting that encourages obedience to authority. For Viktor Frankl, this, of course, was no mere lab experiment. He had seen it firsthand. He had seen this devolution into sadism. The rise of Nazism could only have occurred because large groups of educated and ethical people did not register its cruelty. Or if they registered it, they looked the other way. In studying Viktor Frankl, I saw in my own life how an ordinarily decent human being will act indecently out of obedience to leaders. For example, I remembered the church announcements when I was a teenager. The elders took the pulpit at a worship service and they read a list of the names of fellow congregants who were being disfellowshipped, that is, expelled. The names included those who had been divorced and remarried other people, as well as members who had supported their decision. These divorced individuals would no longer be welcome in the church unless they returned to their former spouses. In some cases, people had been remarried for years and formed new families with children. I tried to imagine what would it be like to be a child and have my parents torn asunder by command of the church. It seemed cruel. Was there no allowance for changes in life, no room for mistakes, no space for grace? Of course, it's not ideal, but divorce happens. In my heart of heart, sitting there, I didn't like this punitive exclusion. It seemed to go against the principle of Christian love and the teaching of Jesus, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And besides, who among us is 100% pure? Who can put ourselves in the place of God to judge another? But I too followed along. This legalism had no love in it. The church proclaimed sinner without stopping to encounter, as Viktor Frankl did, the other person as a unique individual created to love and to be loved. Viktor Frankl sought to bring out the best in people. He never presumed to know the will of God for others. And here's the point. We congregants remained silent in the pews 
as the names of the so-called sinners were named one by one. And, you know, it's the silence of the witnesses that's so disturbing to me now as I remember this scene from an ordinary American church service. Such silence in the face of shaming and banishing others How is this not the basis for even greater cruelty? And sexual sins were seen as especially punishable in the congregation. Little attention was ever given to gluttony, to bearing false witness, to greed, jealousy, judgmentalism, spiritual pride, and other sins more frequently mentioned in the Bible. So it's very humbling to admit. But across the board, I remained obedient to church practices that punished others. Even when it went against my own inner light, my conscience, to thine own self be true, was a teaching that I had heard. But it would be years before I had the courage to live it in actuality. When I read Dante's book, The Divine Comedy, it didn't surprise me to find the passive souls at the entranceway to the inferno. Dante's guide told him, during their life on earth, these passive souls had never taken a stand. They had never followed their heart. They lacked passion and they had gone along with the crowd or sat on a fence. In evading any real decision to truly be themselves, they had not had Victor Frankl's courage to live from individual conscience. Victor Frankl advised that people clarify their own heroic potential that we learn to stand in the light of our own inner conscience. At age 25, the light of inner conscience was dim in me, but it was about to be energized. Soon after my marriage to the minister, I was exposed to a new environment where I heard the message of divine love the very first time.